Well, it's still Plus Sports Special on Plus TV Africa, and I have the Africa's fastest man and current record holder in the 100-meter event with 9.85 seconds. He broke Namibia's Frankie Frederick's old record of 9.86 seconds in 2006, 10 years after Frederick's established it in 1996. Now, he dominated the scene, winning medals in both indoor and outdoor meets until 2008, but he shocked Nigerians by his decision to retire early. At the time, many at athletics lovers were looking forward to seeing him produce more records on the tracks. Now, for 14 years, his record still stands unshaken. I've got to lose Soji Fashuba on the show all the way from the UK. Good to have you with us. Thank you very much. My pleasure being here today. And now, you were the fastest man uh, and still the fastest man in Africa. That record still stands. What was, what was it like achieving that feat? Well, uh, the weeks preceding that were not really the best for me then, if I remember clearly, uh, because I think about three weeks before then, I had done some personal bests in um, a test trial my coach was giving to me, which was the 80 meters, the 120 and the 150. Um, two days before that, I fell sick and I thought I was going to lose that good form. And um, it took me some days. My coach had to change some of my programs. And I remember on the day of the competition, uh, I went for a warm up. Uh, I think I stopped midway and told my coach, I don't think I can do it because I don't understand my body. So my coach had to give me some special stretching. Little did I know that that day was going to be my day. And I think after doing the time trials, my coach thought this watch was sports because the times were so fast in the time trials and the rest was history. Mm. Nice. And what do you think has made it quite difficult to equal that record or even beat it? Well, um, I think Africa is slowly growing. Um, within 14 years now, we begin to see the guys coming up on in nine now. Um, three years, two or three years after the record, I think um, the Africa's athletics was going down on the male side because I think um, the countries were not really investing in the athletes that much. And most athletes were thinking about changing nationality um, to get a better um, to make ends meet because athletics is a job in the long run. And if you don't get enough finances to be able to finance your training, you will not get there. So I think with time, the, ki um, the kids coming up now decide to travel back to America, start going out into Europe to better themselves. And I think that's the change that is happening at the moment. Nice. Now, talk talking about um, athletes getting to leave the country, uh, a couple of these other guys, they've given reasons. They said it's because of support and the training equipment that we do not have in the country. That's why they get to leave. But do you agree with this? Don't you think that these guys should stay back and train more with what we have here in the, in the country and, of course, um, establish themselves out there? Well, it's a bit difficult to say that because um, even during my time, we had no facilities. The tracks were almost dead. I remember training in um, the National Stadium in Lagos and there were patches. <laughs> you could actually see the, t um, the ground on the track. And when you're running, you're trying to avoid this kind of track, which does not give you the conducive environment to be able to train properly. Or in the long run, it's the principle I kind of look at is you've got to be able to have a good condition to do your build-up. Nigeria had a better weather for that, and that was why I decided to stay on my own path. But now, without saying how the state of the track is now, which I believe will be worse than what it was during my time, I think um, going, for the guys going out there will be more of a better opportunity for them, and they will be able to get um, good food to eat, less stress, no traffic congestions in most places, and I think that will help them get better. What do you think is responsible for Nigeria's low performance in athletics events? Because back then, we used to have a, a truckload of medals coming in from uh, gold to silver to bronze, but it has become minimal these days. What do you think is responsible for that? Well, uh, I'm not going to start blaming this present um, federation now because this problem has been coming way even before my time. But I think the effect is just being felt now because of the fact is um, when the officials travel, they weren't really to support the athletes that much. Mm. And I think that has slowly filtered talents that could be coming through. And it's only a very few now starts to come through now because of the effect of um, before my time. Um, during my time, I was always complaining, we are not investing in the younger ones, we should be more of our focus. If we start investing on the younger ones, by the time they get to the top level, they will be able to do well. But I think Nigeria had this, or I would say most African countries had this thing that, oh, we we'll start supporting the athletes when they've got in there, and when they're supporting the athletes, they're giving them peanuts, which that peanuts will 
be better put towards developing the younger ones. Mm. And I think that's where the mistake has been from this time. All right, uh, talking about your retirement now, fans around are uh, of the opinion that you retired quite early. Now, was there a major challenge that led to this uh, decision? Well, I think um, looking back at uh, 2011, when I decided to call it great, um, I think I sat down then and weighed all my options because um, as a young kid coming up, I've always been told, oh, don't think of what the country can do for you. Think of what you can do for yourself. And I used that principle to get to the national level. Uh, of my belief that when I get to the national level, I will be given uh, the support to be able to go further. Um, I think when I looked, I sat down in 2011 and looked back and saw, all right, I won the World Indoors 2008. I got no recognition for that. I broke the African record, got no recognition for that got a Commonwealth silver medal and all lots of African titles. I was undefeated in Africa for a long time. And look back at the support I got, that did not equate. And if you look at it, it's just, and let's sports is a business. If you're not getting the amount of money you're going to be getting consistently, you would not survive. And I looked at that time, I think I waited out that I think I've achieved more than what most of my counterparts would have been able to achieve with the little I got. And I think that was the right time for me to buy out. Mm. Now, but do you regret leaving the scene too soon? Um, to some extent, I'm human, and I'll say a little bit, because I know I still had a lot in me then. I was injured all right, but I soon was able to come back, but I had to put my future ahead. I knew my kids were going to be coming out, so I knew that, yes, I had to start planning for them. If I want them to go to the same condition I went to, well, the answer for me was a big no. I think um, family-wise was more of the major reason I decided to move forward because I knew if I kept going, um, I didn't feel Nigeria was going to get any better. I was at once all the top lawyers I could win as an individual and team as well, and nothing came. So I don't think anything was going to come again. So I just had to make a um, future for my family. Mm, true. And a, a couple of Nigerians back there, they, they had to dump Nigeria to go represent other countries. Well, they, I, I know the likes of Francis Obikwelu and a couple of other guys who left the shores of Nigeria. Um, why didn't you take that step to leave Nigeria? Why, why did you have so much belief in the country that we could produce um, the, the, the goods? Well, um, as a man, as my dad has always been patriotic to the country, and I've always felt that, okay, um, I could make a difference. Um, I believe that if I was able to go down there and prove my worth, maybe something will happen. Did that really work out well? You win some, you lose some. I think that was one of the battles I lost because mm. I bet if I had changed my nationality now, I will still be competing or getting ready to actually retire at this particular time. Mm. But in long run, I had so much faith in Nigeria that oh, well, they will do the needful when they start seeing records coming. But I think I should have learned from the past that that would not have been the case. Um, if I had continued, I had no retirement plan. In the sense that um, by the time I stopped running, no one's going to give me a retirement plan in the sense of money to take in myself in my old age. Um, yes, I did invest myself, but how long will that have taken me? And I've seen that uh, most athletes, if they keep going through that, and as I said, when I look at it from that point of view, in the sense that the money the country was giving me was not enough to be able to take care of myself. So in the long run, I had to look for better means to take care of myself and my family. True. Now, uh, sportsmen and women love to see their children get involved with sports. In football, you know, the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo has enrolled his kid uh, to start playing for um, uh, uh, Juventus. And a couple of other sports guys are out there who encourage their children to get into sports. Are your kids involved in any sports? Yeah, uh, my kids are involved in sports at the moment. I know they play uh, lawn tennis a bit, and they do a bit of track as well. I try not to force them into one particular sport because the pressure will get too much. So I think I kind of give them a free will, as my parents did, because my parents didn't pressure me, oh, it has to be this particular sport, it has to be football. No, that was not the way I was brought up, and I don't think my kids will, will be brought up that way. So in the long run, they've got a free vain to try every sport that they can and if they want to go along that line fine if not then it was their oyster now take us through your journey on how athletics started for you and you joining the british royal navy i'm really interested in this story well um, i think my story um part of it is going to be what i was told by my mom um, i think um, when i was born when kids were walking um, Parents noticed I was crawling everywhere. And when I mean crawling, I was print crawling, if I could call it that. Mm -hmm. And I think my mom was panicking because of the fact is I didn't get up and walk on time. But the day I finally got up, instead of walking, I was running everywhere. So they had wow. to chase me everywhere. So I think that's when it really started for me as a baby 
<laughs> at the age of about one and a half or two. And going into primary school, secondary schools, I was always quite fast and always very competitive. And I think I remember at the age of seven, um, I was watching Carl Lewis run, and I walked up to my mom and said, um, I don't understand why people were celebrating him because I believe I'm faster than him. So I think at the age of seven, I had that belief that I was going to be fast. But my mind wasn't didn't go that fast. Oh, I will be in the Olympics or I'll be watch world championship medalist. Um, I think um, in secondary school as well, uh, I used to no, in primary school, sorry. In primary school, I used to get hired as a missionary to go around to release for the secondary school. And no one actually knew I was in primary school when I was doing all that. So I think that fast gene has been in me from a little childhood. And on getting uh, my secondary school, which I attended in Saplin, married me secondary school, um, I did all the sports from 100 meters to 200 meters. I had a safe competition from a few people, like one of my friends uh, called Wani, um, he's a musician at the moment now, um, he used to give me safe competition there, but I always won most of them. And um, I think from then on, I got called into sports in 1998. And that is where I met some really fast people. And I remember crying back home to my mom that I could not believe anybody was actually faster than me because I always believed I was the fastest man in the world at that particular time. I was still young. Then. But um, on getting to track, um, I had to ask the coach, um, how come these guys are fast? And that's when he told me, oh, it was training that they did. And I was like, oh, I started training. I quit it two months later. I was like, I don't think I could ever get fast. And I remember January 1st, um, 1999, I woke up and said, I'm going to walk twice as hard as any man mm. and to be able to get there. And I, went, I remember going to the track the next day and asked the coach, how many times did this guy train? And he told me some once, some twice, and he decided to train three times a day. Mm. And that's how it all started for me to um, I go into the university, won the university games, went to the World University game, but got injured there, could not run. And then the championships came on, silver, the African Games, and I just went and started winning from there. Um, so in 11, I decided to call it quits because um, I was planning on the future. And I saw that if I kept doing this, I'll keep doing this. The country will keep getting the glory. I'll get the glory as well. But by the time I finish, I'll be one of the forgotten heroes. And the public people will be donating money for me at some point. So I was like, no, I'm not going to let my future go that way. I decided to take my future in my hands and apply to join the Royal Navy in the, um, in the Oxford branch. And that's how my career continued. Mm. Now, your, your journey into the British Royal um, Navy. Well, um, when I applied to join, little did I know what was going to happen because when I got down there, um, mm. I was told, oh, it's going to be a four years wait. Yeah. So um, I felt if I was going to wait for four years, I'll probably go back into sports and never want to pursue this line again. So they offered me the Royal Marines, uh, which I took. I joined the Royal Marine not knowing what it was. And on seeing the training there, I was like, oh, my God, this is really tough. But I was other man, being in mind that I have a strong mind that if I want to do something, I'm going to do it at all costs. And I think I passed the PMRC, which is like the training for the recruits for the Royal Marines, which is a bunch of the Navy as well. And on, when I got in there, the training was meant to be 32 weeks. And I think the major there, who was Major Hood, was like, oh, no, you're such a great talent. We know that if you continue along this, we're going to damage you. And he offered me to go back into the Navy. And that's how I got back into the Navy part of um the Navy itself, of the Armed Forces, and as a logistician. So I qualified as a logistician in 2011, and I served in various shapes before I decided to transfer over to work with the submarines. Wow, interesting uh, story right there. And I'm, I'm sure a whole lot of people are looking up to you, and they will surely want to be like you at the end of the day. Now, coming back to the Athletics Federation of Nigeria, what advice do you have for them to make things better for the young athletes? Well, um, it's, it's, I know they're trying to climb a mountain at the moment because of the fact is um, there's so many factions uh, and there are two factions in the Federation at the moment. One believes the other one has been squashed. The other one doesn't believe that as well. But as I said, um, all this infighting will not move us forward. Um, what, the, what I believe the Federation needs to really work on, and I believe the current president in the name of um, Olamide George is doing, is trying to create more avenues in which these athletes can compete. Um, this is all the athletes need. They need to be able to compete to showcase their talent. They need, I think the Federation needs to start setting up more um, things like drugs, 
awareness program for the athletes to realize that drugs is not the way because many athletes believe, oh, most of these top athletes use it, but, so I must use it as well. No, that's not the case. I can tell you I have never missed a dope test. Uh, I've never missed a uh, whereabouts test in my career. I was always tested all my life. I think at one point in one week, I was tested about five times. I was tested in Nigeria as well. I never missed a test. So I think those are the kind of things the Federation can do. They also need to try and source out funds from private investors because this talent is our future. We want. We all look at the Olympics and keep saying, oh, we don't have any Nigerian in the finals. But the question, that's not a question we should be asking. We should be asking, what support are these athletes getting? And I think the Federation can try and do like awareness program to let companies know you want medals, you've got to invest in these athletes. If you don't invest in them, there's no way you're going to get these medals. The athletes need a lot of money. You may look at somebody running the 100 meters, but he trains. For, there's a reason why the Olympics is four years. You've got to walk You've got to work twice as hard as every human being to be able to work without four years just to even go to the Olympics. So what does it mean to get a medal? You have to yeah. work three times as harder as any normal human being to be able mm -hmm. to get that. What does that need? It needs a lot of money. He says that. What do you need money for? People will be asking. Well, first of all, you need medical treatment. Without that, your artist is not going to go far. And that medical treatment does not mean, oh, it's when you get injured, you go to see your physiotherapist. No, you've got to be able to treat, get regular treatments, regular massages, and that costs money. You need to be able to pay your coach as well. You need to be able to go on a balanced diet. You can't keep eating ever, every day to be able to get there. You've got to be able to have that nutritional strength to be able to compete with these top athletes as well. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that money is needed for. And I think if these artists don't get this money, they won't get it. And I think this is where the Federation needs to come in and showcase their top athletes and their upcoming athletes as well so that people will be aware that these are the talents that they've got. Now let's talk about parental influence now. Were your parents supportive when you ventured into sports? I mean, I know a couple of parents back then that would say sports was majorly for college dropouts, but now I'm sure they're beginning to see the positives coming from sports. Were your parents supportive? My parents were very supportive. Um, I can tell you, my dad never missed any of my entire sports in school. In wow. fact, if he wasn't walk, he's driving that fast to come down there. And he was always running all the father's race. So I think I had a full support. And I could say I could not do it without my loving parents' support because they were there at all times. Um, I remember when I got injured massively, my mom saw me broken. She was down as well. She ran everywhere to look for money just to get me treated. And that was the kind of love and support I got from my parents really, to get there. And that is why I will always be forever grateful to them for supporting me and not trying to tell me to stop. Mm. Nice, nice. Now, as we go, um, is there anything you're doing to support the young athletes in Nigeria or something we should be looking forward to? Yes, um, I've started uh, my project, which is called SaveOurSports.ng. Um, it's still in the starting phase. It's a bit harder for me because I'm not really based in Nigeria. Uh, I really want to see that grow. We're trying to look for sponsors as well that can sponsor so we can put the eye and try and put a little hope. To the athletes as well. Um, I'm trying to also look at the arm um, of in the later years, try and get a program that we can start educating um, the kids on how to plan their nutritional um, values for their training. Um, stay away from drugs. This is one of my big, um, big concern because so many artists believe in some, not so many, but a few artists believe that um, they need drugs to get there, which is one of my big aids. Um, I also try and help in mentor mentoring some athletes in their training program. Um, I like to say this at this point, I'm not a coach, <laughs> because most people want me to coach them, but I can give them some tips yeah. to be able to get to where they need to be at this particular certain time. So these are the little things we are doing, and I'm hoping when um, I retire from the Navy, I'll be able to grow that platform to be as big as it can be. Well, thank you very much for your time, and we long to see if that record will be broken, when and how it will be broken. We're surely looking forward to uh, that time. Yeah, we're, we're, we are looking forward, because one thing people don't understand is if records are not broken, it means we are stagnant. The world mm. record has been broken so many times, but the African record stays there. So for us to move as a, as a continent forward, we need guys running fast and breaking records and breaking them consistently. So I think that is one of the main things I'm trying to push on for, that these athletes, we need to support them to be able to break records and be able to own the 100 meter African record and the 100 meter world record, not just the African record. Mm. Thank you very much. And indeed, you are a living legend. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be on the show. All right. Please continue to stay safe out there. And uh, of course, uh, keep it locked down.
Thank you very much. Bro. <laughs>